Hello, my name is Julian Cardona and today I'm going to be speaking to you about the first two chapters of the book Rhetoric, a very short introduction by Richard Toy. In this book he talks about the beginnings of rhetoric, uh, some of its most important players and then focuses more on some types of rhetoric, some techniques and then he focuses on talking about some more modern types of rhetoric and examples of modern, modern speeches that employ rhetoric. Uh, he says that rhetoric began in the 5th century BCE with the Sophists, who were the first to teach the secrets of rhetoric at a high price, even though they did not invent this technique of speaking, uh, because it was found in earlier Greek literature like with Homer, uh, it, they were the first to actually gain money from it and to teach it uh, for, for money. Then uh, Plato comes, who is one of their biggest critics, because he believed that rhetoric created belief without knowledge. And he writes two dialogues in which he takes Socrates and makes him debate against a sophist Protagoras. Uh, he did this in his, in his writings, in which he took two characters that were real or maybe not, and made them debate against each other. And so he does this in this book and makes makes an example of how sophists are wrong and his ideas are correct through the use of the character of Socrates. He then moves to the we then move to Isocrates, who was one of the renowned ten Attic orators. And he wrote some books that were against the sophists, but um but he was a sophist himself. Um, his target was to show that other sophist teachers had inferior methods of teaching to his because he had a school which focused on the rules and the practice and the use of ex examples on more a technical aspect of rhetoric and he criticized other teachers for not following this. Then we move to Aristotle, uh, who was a disciple of Pl Plato. He said that rhetoric itself was the faculty of observing in any given case the available means of persuasion. That was like the definition given to rhetoric and it was written by Aristotle. <clears throat> this is to say that it was not simply about creating phrases that were beautiful or that were were thrilling. They, they, it was about more creating a situation and reading the situation and seeing how how this what was happening could be deployed in a rhetorical way, like taking the event that was going on and and using rhetoric in the most effective way to win an audience. Then we move off to Rome, we move from Greek to Rome to C Cicero, who was a Roman orator who believed that Roman orators were brilliant. They had a raw talent for, or for <coughs> rhetoric and speaking, but they were missing the style. The style that the Greeks had, they, they didn't have it. And there was also a very, very important aspects about the Roman world. Uh, in there, the ideas about rhetoric and public speaking uh, <coughs> had hierarchical and, and social tensions. They, they were dependent, who could participate in public speaking uh, would depended not only about class, but also about gender, because public speaking was reserved only for men, not for women. Then uh, we move on to, to another character that perhaps was not a rhetorical uh, philosophy himself, but used rhetoric due to his Roman nature, <clears throat> and that was Apostle Paul uh, from the Bible. We can see it in his letters, more, more specifically in his letter to Romans, that he uses argumentative techniques that reflect culturally established rhetorical norms. After this, we can move to the three branches of oratory, which are very self-explanatory once I read, once you know them, but they can mix themselves and can be used uh, in different at the same time in a same speech these three branches are the forensic and judicial rhetoric that can be found in a courtroom or other legal context the second one is the epideictic or display rhetoric that is the rhetoric concerned with praise or blame then we have the deliberative rhetoric that is used to preserve a group and toy gives us an example that for example uh, voters or legislators that vote towards a particular action and um, after we now, now that we know the three branches of oratory, we come up to the five canons, which are five 
five things that are crucial to the development of a speech. First, we have invention or discovery, which refers to the process of coming up with arguments that are appropriate to the situation, which involves reflecting on the nature of the audience we're going to be talking about. After this is the arrangement, which talks about how to order the material you're going to be presenting. After that, it's a style and is concerned with the language you're going to use in your speech. Is the choice of words and the way that they are put together and the use of figures of speech that compose this style canon. Then is the memory canon, which is something that is perhaps not, not as used today, the use of total memory when you're giving a speech. But in classic rhetorical education, it was crucial to memorize completely the speech. But uh, Toy talks about how, <coughs> sorry, it's not important to memorize completely, but to use building blocks that you have in your mind and, and use those building blocks in any situation to create a speech. Because sometimes there might be a, a, a failure in the technology or something like that, and you need to be able to do your speech uh, even if you don't have it in, in word by word. And last is delivery, because these are how you deliver your speech, uh, how your accent, your posture, your gestures, your tone of voice, and so forth. And this is very, very important because it has a profound effect of how on how the speech is delivered. Uh, after this, we move on to the three appeals, which are ethos, which means character, Pathos, which means emotion, and logos, which means logic. This, these categories are identified by Aristotle, and the, a speech will usually involve more than one of these, not only one, and frequently it will use all three, depending on the situation, who I'm trying to convince, and what I am trying to convince them of. The last thing that I found interesting in this writing was how he talks about visual rhetoric, which means that it talks about how clothing gestures and the use of physical space can reinforce a verbal message. We can see this in the in cinema how they use they use different different types of, of camera movements or change of scenes that show how that can create tension, happiness, different things. And he gives an example of the Martin Luther King Jr. speech and how it was very important. How it was a very important speech and how it had many symbols of family his, his priestly clothes and all that were very important as well. Uh, and that's basically my infographic and I hope that it helps you. Thank you very much.